corridor task force. Uh, let's see, it's our third meeting, if I'm not mistaken. And Lynette, I think we need to call the roll to make this official. Thank you, good morning. Director Allard, absent. Dialdo? Yes. Harris? I am here, good morning. Thank you, good morning. Jankovitz, absent. Kozlowski? Here. Samayoa? Here. Shanir, absent. Slowey? Here. Vice Chair Saragossa will be joining us later. He's absent. And Chair Sander? Here. Thank you. And then our SACOG appointee, Mike Dower? Dewar and Red Hair. Dewar, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Red Hair. Dewar. And our private members, Louise Bedsworth? Here. Thank you. Jose Bodipo Mimba? Absent. Stefan Dawes? Stephen, here. Thank you. All right. Isabel Domeco, absent. Sandra Drown, absent. She'll be joining us later. Dina Ellis, absent. Chet Hewitt, absent. Amy Lappin. I'm here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Jennifer Madelich. Good morning. I'm here. Thank you. Michael Stretch. Good morning, present. And Julie Young. Present. Thank you. All right, Michael, where are you? I've been looking at those buildings. Oh, I'm down on 555 Capitol Mall. We're going to do a promotional piece later today. So ah, all I'm, right. I'm, I'm slumming down uh, Yeah, on the Capitol Mall. It's very nice. I, it's an interesting I, angle there. Is it? Yeah, it's good. It's, yeah. It's, this it's is nice. nice. I like yeah. that. It's very cosmopolitan. That's, that's the way we roll. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. First up at uh, well, actually scheduled for 9.15 is Race Equity Inclusion Board. But before we get there, does anybody have any commercial corridor updates you'd like to briefly share with us? I've got one little snippet. Anybody else have anything, anything happened in the past six months on your commercial corridors? You know, so like here's add, mine. I, it's, if, it's a, if I could add one thing, just real uh, quick. Yes, go ahead, Sean. Um, with, uh, you know, Ricky and I both, the new bridge between our two cities, we've officially opened it up, and that's going to be um, a real good catalyst, I think, for the commercial corridors on both sides of this river. We're even having a hotel um, being built right at the base of the Fifth Street Bridge in the Yuba City side. And so, um, basically, that's an update. We're making progress, and it's finally visible progress, which is always encouraging, and we're looking forward to more, to seeing more on both sides of the river. So we're excited about that. Just want to throw that out there briefly. Very good. Anybody else? So this cool. isn't much, much of an update. This is Amy Lappin with EPS. Um, we, along with Asset Environmental and a few other consultants, got started on um, the Stockton Boulevard specific plan uh, planning process. Um, so we are just commencing um, a lot of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. There's a heavy focus on anti-displacement and investment without um, uh, displacement and affordable housing. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. All right. David, um, I can just add a little bit from the private sector. Sure, um, urban, urban Elements is in um, planning review and ready to submit building plans on a 148 unit housing project in West Sacramento that's an attainable by design project. It's market rate. It's not affordable, but my development partner and I have made a commitment to hold rental rates to 1150 per month for 122 units and 100 and 1250 a month for 26 of the units and this is 75% uh, of the um, the median income so we're actually 25% below the target range for median income affordable housing but as a market rate transaction, we can deliver this project for about 20 million, as opposed to um, what I understand affordable projects of similar size sometimes range in the 50 to $70 million wow. price range. Um, the second thing I can report on is we are initiating a program at another uh, project we have for persons of color where we are um, activating eight single family homes that are in a collaborative space in Midtown 
where um, we are actually contributing to every $480,000 live work home purchase, $40,000 from urban elements to each home buyer so that we can offset the cost of uh, first in housing slash workspace where you can work with a home occupancy permit so that we can um, start building generational wealth for families, um, for persons of color. And that program will be supported with a five-year operating program that enables the businesses to collaborate, collaboratively market together so that they can host community events and basically get credit for their creative capital. Um, and creative capital, as you know, is always undervalued. So we're hoping that can be a good catalyst project as well. So um, just a couple projects I'm really proud of, and I think they're relative probably to growth on capital corridors. That's great. Thank you. The example of the first one is particularly telling, and I wish that story you just told about costs, you know, if you can nail that down as much as possible and, and tell that story. All too often, everyone thinks affordable housing must be done with some government program and subsidy and and all the strings and weights that go on to that. Um, and it's just, it's never been done that way in the country effectively. The only way to do this is private sector. The private sector is the only sector large enough to be able to handle it. Um, and we've got ourselves so tied in knots, we're, we're you know really damaging our economy. So I, that is a powerful story. Thank you. We're hopeful to share all of this information with the SACOG task force because obviously we want it to be repeatable in other communities and would love to be a catalyst for that type of work. And frankly, the SACOG task force, I really want to thank the whole team because you've been really instrumental in kind of inspiring and supporting us on our track. And I, I will just share one final comment because I think this is really relative to the discussion that you guys will be hosting today. And the comparison between doing 148 studio housing units at a you know market rate attainable point of entry versus single family homes that would yield the same occupancy the fee structure difference between the 25 residential homes where you could have six occupants each versus 148 studio units was a 3.7 million dollar difference it would cost 1.5 million in uh, for for the single family homes, the 25 units versus I want to say 5.3 million for the studio housing product, which is why the conversation we're having today is so vital because this per unit cost is really bearing out as a barrier that. Fortunately, the city of West Sacramento is really, really working with us to, to remove this through a development agreement. But again, it's another thing I really want to be able to share with the task force so you can understand how uh, removing this barrier could be a huge uh, instigator of, of progress in our, our various communities. Good. Well, my, my snippet, uh, I hope at least, well, everyone here can probably relate to it at some level. We've got uh, an intersection in Rancho Cordova. It's Folsom Boulevard and Zinfandel. Light rail runs up and down Folsom Boulevard. There's a station right there at Folsom Boulevard and Zinfandel. It's surrounded on all fronts by shopping, about half of which is productively, highly productively occupied. The other half needs to be turned into housing, basically, for for long-term survival, at least some other use. There's just too much too much retail in that location. And right on the corner, uh, the most likely to flip corner into something else comes a proposal to chop a parking lot in half and add the region's most popular drive-through coffee venue, by far. Ooh. With hundreds, maybe thousands of residents telling us we need this. This is necessary. It must be here. <laughs> and the developer unwilling to consider any other location. It's that or nothing. Great conundrum to be in. Because you can imagine what that council chamber is going to look like. Right? <laughs> how, do you, how do you frame that up so that, or, or, I think, trying to think outside the box, is there a way to reposition this so that that becomes the, I don't know how you minimize the cars in a drive-through, but there is a plaza possibility here. I don't know. So that's that's our conundrum. 
And I, and I know everyone's felt that pain because you want to do something right on the court. You want to be transit supportive and all you ever hear are auto uses. <laughs> That's the only thing that pencils out. All right. So with that wonderful news, we're going to move on to race equity and inclusion. And let's see, who's going to give me this update? James, is that you or do we have another, another board member willing to give me this update? So basically the background here is in June, um, the chair and the vice chair called for the creation of a, of a special working group, a board working group, and they have met twice. And uh, James, why don't you tell us briefly about what they're taking on and, and what they look like uh, their future might be. Happy to give a brief update, Chair Sander. Also, uh, we have the SICOG board vice chair, uh, Ricky Samayoa, on, on this call, who is co-leading that. Um, so actually yesterday, that, that working group met a third time. Um, I know this has been on the forefront of everybody's mind. Um, it has, I know, for the, for the board. So this is a working group of the SACOG board. Uh, actually, again, third, third meeting yesterday. And I guess the, uh, here, <clears throat> here's the brief update, at least from my perspective. Um, uh, being a relative newcomer still to this region three years in, uh, this is one of the most diverse regions, six counties in the United States. Uh, it's diverse by all kinds of things, uh, geography, uh, politics, but it's also diverse by uh, race, ethnicity, and income. But that diversity, I think, is not, has not been our strength. And if you look at our disparities, just our economic outcomes, our education outcomes, our disparities by thing like, things like uh, broadband, right, which I think everybody is now realizing the, the disparities that exist and things like um, the digital divide. So those racial disparities are huge, just from a simple economic perspective. Um, I, I, you know, the Brookings uh, folks came in a couple of years ago and said, you know, uh, hey, your, 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 your short-term numbers economically look really good, but you've got some underlying issues you have to take care of. And one of them was racial disparities uh, that exist, frankly, all across our six county region. So um, board met yesterday, the working group met yesterday. We've hired a consultant named the McKenzie Mack Group out of Chicago. Uh, they are going to be doing, uh, we're, we're sort of slowing this process down and, and Monica is our staff lead on this. Um, slowing it down in terms of actions and what we should do and, and education or even trainings or workshops around racial equity and, um, uh, and, and inclusion, economic inclusion. And we're doing a racial equity audit that should be done. It'll be the next couple of months uh, for our agency. There'll be interviews with staff, board members, stakeholders, partners. Uh, and we're really trying to understand where we kind of, wh where we are right now as an agency. And there's two goals here. One is to look at our internal operations and how we work as an agency. And the second, of course, is the external impact. Um, and I would say, you know, um, I know we've had some folks asking, well, you know, what's SACOG doing getting into racial equity? I don't think you have to look much further than transportation, housing, our core strengths, even commercial corridors. Uh, I think you don't have to go any further than this topic <laughs> that this task force is focused on. And, and, and Julie and others have spoken very eloquently about this. Um, housing, housing attainability, uh, building wealth, attainable housing, small businesses on commercial corridors, one of the best ways of building capital and wealth. The number of uh, communities and people of color who own small businesses in our region is off the charts. And, and uh, we've got to do, we believe we have to be more intentional and do more. So, so, so more to come. I don't, I don't have any, um, uh, there are no conclusions here, only, um, only you know, intentions, a working group, uh, report back from our consultant in November, probably to the full board in December. And uh, we're trying to be very thoughtful and intentional and approach this, as many of our board members say, with some humility and understanding that we don't have all the answers to solve these things yet. Um, I don't think we have been explicit or intentional enough around racial disparities, racial equity, uh, and inclusion. And so that is, our, that is our intention that's in front of us. So more to come. Happy to have anybody else jump in who's been on the working group. All right, very good. Ricky, anything you want to add? Uh, just maybe an update on, on things that we have accomplished the last three weeks, uh, the last three meetings. Um, we uh, 
drafted a, a charge for for the for the for the um, for the work for the working group, and that's going to be presented to the board uh, uh, this month. Um, uh, we also um, had input on the uh, framework, on the funding framework that we're also going to see this month uh, in adding, uh, assuring that um, equity and race are, are, are embedded within uh, um, the, you know, the funding framework because it's a big opportunity to take on. And of course, we hired the consultant to try to provide us with some, uh, in my mind, some reflection on who, who we are as an organization and and, uh, and how can we move forward uh, and, and, be, and have, a, you know, the greatest impact that we can with, with, the, with, with the work that we do uh, throughout the region. Um, so uh, I'm pretty proud of the work that we've done already and we'll look forward to continuing sharing uh, the work, uh, group's work with all of you. And, and I think what James said about the commercial corridors and how that, that's going to, you know, I think all these things that we're doing they might seem disconnected, but I think they really are part of this whole uh, approach that we're taking in, in assuring that, that we consider, um, uh, you know, displacement or, or things that have been left behind for a long time with a lot of, with not a lot of investment and ensuring that we can uh, identify those things and support it and use data to drive a lot of our decision. All right, any questions for James or Ricky? Okay, let's move on to our next topic, which is infill, gentrification, and displacement. We are joined by Miriam Zook. She's with Enterprise Community Partners. You know, in, uh, in Ranch Cordova, we've, I was just talking about some, we've got a lot of locally owned businesses. They're a part of the fabric. Uh, as we figure out how to invest and upgrade our commercial corridor, we want to be sure not to lose lose those folks. We want to bring them along, raise them up with us. And I think uh, Dr. Zook is going to be able to tell you some, uh, stra some strategies and, and some of the intentional investment strategies or planning that may go into maintaining those uh, relationships within our community. Um, I think you received a bio by, uh, by email, so you know a little bit about her. But please welcome all the way from Chicago, Dr. Miriam Zook, Senior Program Director with Enterprise. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. You can hear me, it looks like. Yes. Okay. The Zoom share screen is, always gets me a little tripped up. And can you see a PowerPoint? Yes. Awesome. Great. So thanks so much for inviting me today. Um, as was mentioned, my, my name is Miriam Zook. I am with Enterprise Community Partners. I'm also uh, one of the co-founders and still a senior advisor um, with the Urban Displacement Project at UC Berkeley. So I am going to be talking mostly about my work uh, with the Urban Displacement Project, although Enterprise Community Partners were also very, uh, this is very relevant to the work I'm doing right now, but it's mostly Urban Displacement Project work. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with the Urban Displacement Project, this is a research and action initiative at UC Berkeley. Uh, they work on doing community-engaged, data-driven, applied research uh, to produce, to reframe conversations, empower advocates and policymakers, and, and train and inspire the next generation of leaders in equitable development. Um, so Doug uh, had asked me to do really more background information about like what is gentrification and displacement, uh, what do we know about it, um, and how does it relate to commercial uh, revitalization. So that's sort of high level I'm going to be talking about today. I believe that you're going into a deep dive discussion about strategies um, after. But at the Urban Displacement Project, we spent a lot of time, um, this is a project that we got started around 2013. Uh, through some ARB funded research, trying to understand really focusing in on transit investments. But I think as we learned more about public investments in general, um, we, we kind of expanded our understanding um, about gentrification. And we spent a lot of time trying to define it because we found a lot of people were saying, oh, we know kind of what it is, but it's hard to define and hard to measure. So we did a lot of work up front trying to define and, and put and measure gentrification. Uh, and we landed on this definition of gentrification as a process of neighborhood change that includes new investments in a neighborhood that might be public investment like transit or revitalizing a commercial corridor 
that might be private investments like new businesses going in, um, new, new uh, developments going in, um, and that those investments are related to changes in the residents. Um, and so new residents coming in that uh, may, be, may look different than the residents that were already living in those places. They might be higher income, higher educational attainment, more likely to be white. Um, so, so this is sort of like a general overview of what gentrification looks like. And we developed these explainer videos. Um, you see the link on the upper right hand corner of this slide that really goes into those definitions of what is gentrification. And in that video, we talk about the three kind of three pieces that are important to understand gentrification, the historic conditions that create the context of disinvested neighborhoods that are sort of ripe for gentrification and change, that, that are ripe for reinvestment, um, the investments and policy decisions that go into reinvesting in those neighborhoods. Uh, and then how it impacts community, the residents that were there before the new the change happened, the residents that are, that, that are coming in, uh, the residents that are able to stay or are displaced from the neighborhood. We also created an explainer video about displacement because again, they're just like people don't understand what is gentrification, people weren't understanding what is dis displacement. So um, here you can see the link to our video about displacement that we did with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And very generally, we talk about how displacement um, really is the, the phenomenon of when um, a household is forced to move from their place of residence for reasons beyond their control. So that can be a lot of different things. That can be increasing prices. Um, that can be landlord disinvestment for renters um, that making their their unit either uninhabitable or their neighborhood unsafe. Um, so a lot of different drivers that we go into in that video as well. And there's there's more and more research coming out about the health impacts of gentrification and displacement um, that look at how Higher housing costs can force vulnerable households to cut back on basic needs. Um, displacement can lead can um, lead to increased exposure to a lot of, of health hazards. Uh, it can lead to increased stress and anxiety and can exacerbate chronic conditions. Um, and, and there's other uh, other phenomena. We know, I mean, we know, especially in California, how displacement often is related to our ongoing homelessness crisis and the increasing homelessness crisis. So. There's myriad impacts uh, of gentrification and displacement. We tried to study some of those um, uh, in Silicon Valley, where we did a survey of displaced households um, and tried to understand, you know, what was the impact of the, the, the eviction or displacement? Um, where did they go? Uh, um, and how, how did this generally impact them? And so um, we found that you know, a lot of the people that were being displaced from their homes in Silicon Valley were displaced to worse off neighborhoods. Um, often they're moving somewhat close to uh, their previous place of residence um, and might be ending up in precarious situations like hotel doubling up, couch surfing, which as we know in this time of coronavirus is, is a huge health hazard. Uh, so thinking, kind of drilling down on the, the investment side of things, again, our, our work really got funded by transit investment questions. Um, so again, we know that there's lots of different types of investments and we actually wrote a paper really kind of drilling into a lot of the different types of investments. But this, um, we, uh, our director, Karen Chappell, wrote a book with um, a co-author at UCLA, Anastasia Lucado Sideris. Um, where they, they really covered like a lot of the research that we've been doing at the Displacement Project, trying to understand the role of transit, um, why transit neighborhoods might be more vulnerable to gentrification, in part because they had more renters, um, the fact that investments do lead to higher property values and rents, the change in the, the composition of the residents may lag quite a bit from some of those increased housing costs, um, but there is significant reason for displacement concerns. Uh, we also did, I think this is part of the reason why Dove contacted me in the first place, because he, he, when he was at uh, UC Berkeley, he participated in some research we were doing on commercial gentrification. Again, this was a really around transit questions, 
but we were trying to understand like how commercial turnover is related to residential gentrification is related to transit impacts. Um, it was a very it was a very ambitious project, I should say. Um, and like and so really trying to untangle those different things. I should say it was it was a very challenging project. Looking at commercial turnover is a very challenging endeavor. Um, but we know mostly from community experience, there's a lot of concern about how investments spent investments in a corridor might lead to um, loss of small businesses, um, transitioning of the types of businesses that are on a corridor, like who are they serving? Are they serving local residents? Are they, are they regionally serving? So are people coming in from outside of the neighborhood? Are they serving the needs of existing residents or the new coming residents coming in? Uh, there's been a lot of concern and, and writing about loss of minority owned businesses, which we certainly saw evidence of in some research we did in the mission in San Francisco. And then questions about, you know, there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg question about um, if you invest in the commercial corridor, how does that affect surrounding property values and changes in the neighborhood residential composition? Are you drawing in people from that revitalization? Um, new residents into that area, um, or is new residents in the area really increasing demand for commercial revitalization? So there's a lot of questions. Uh, there's a lot, it's a burgeoning area of research, I would say, but still super underdeveloped. Uh, but our work with community groups, know, like from people on the ground, we know that when you invest in a corridor, it affects the local residents, it affects who's able to live there, who's able to afford um, goods and services. Uh, and so we know that these are inextricably linked. Um, but I invite you on our on the urbandisplacement.org website. There is a report up there that you can find, um, and a lot of great research and literature review in there as well. Um, and I'm sure. Well, I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, I know in the Bay Area, anytime there's any kind of investment along a corridor, there is community concern about how this is going to affect um, their rents. Uh, property values, how, how much is this going to lead to displacement? And so we were um, asked to provide a little bit of guidance when um, the County of San Mateo was going to be doing some work on Middlefield Road. Um, and communities, there's a bunch of low-income disinvested communities around there, North Fair Oaks, um, parts of East of Palo Alto were really, uh, impacted, and they um, they were really genuinely concerned. Uh, what is this going to do to to their ability to stay in their neighborhoods, to their favorite mom and pop shop, their their local taqueria, um, and how are they being involved in that planning process? So we were really trying to help them work through um, how to involve local residents, how to make sure that any type of um, streetscape improvements, any kind of revitalization didn't negatively affect the existing residents or make it prohibitively costly for low-income residents to move into those neighborhoods into the future. So I, I pulled a couple of slides that I, I like to use when thinking about equitable development. It seems to be all the rage right now. Um, and, you know, we, again, at the Urban Displacement Project, really were focusing on residential displacement, um, a little bit on commercial displacement, um, but more, more residential. And when we talked about anti-displacement um, and equitable development, we really focused in on these three three pillars of anti-displacement, tenant protections, preservation, uh, preservation of existing affordable housing, and production of new affordable housing units. Um, we created this framework on the right-hand side that I'm not going to go into, but I will share my slides um, with the committee if you're interested. Um, and it's also most of this material is available on the Urban Displacement website. Um, but it, I think it can be helpful to be thinking about, are, are, we, be, are we doing work that's preventative? Like, maybe displacement and gentrification hasn't happened yet, and we really need to be thinking preventatively that if we're going to reinvest in this neighborhood, we make sure that it positively impacts existing residents and not negatively. Um, or is it responsive? Do you already hear that people are being pushed out, um, and what do we need to do to deal with that or, or slow the flow? Um, you might be thinking about um, on the vertical, thinking about people-based strategies, like what can we do for individual households versus place-based and housing strategies, like the thinking neighborhood-wide. So just a couple of different sort of um, matrices to help you sort of think through the types of strategies you go, you're considering. And then I pulled some slides of, um, there's a lot uh, right now on equitable development in corridors. Again, usually this tends to be around transit. I know there's some work around BRTs, um, but I think this is relevant probably to any real corridor work. Um, I know here in Chicago, we are doing a lot, um, the city is doing some invest, 
something called Invest Out West that is focusing on specific commercial corridors in really disinvested neighborhoods. Um, and we're trying to partner with them to think about preservation um, because, because we know that as we reinvest in these neighborhoods, prices are going to go up. Housing prices are already going up. Even in disinvested neighborhoods, housing prices continue to rise. Um, we'll see how the coronavirus uh, pandemic affects that, but, but housing prices rise and that does affect people's ability to stay in neighborhoods as they change. So Twin Cities, um, people often look to the Twin Cities as they think about, um, they did, they were very intentional in thinking about um, their rail and how that was going to impact um, commercial uh, stores, um, especially local mom and pop stores, minority owned businesses. Um, and they did a lot of work. They did this program called Ready for Rail, where they really supported local businesses um, to be able to weather that change as they did the revitalization and investment in light rail. Uh, I was a consultant or uh, an advisor on some work that was done by um, Metro in, um, in Portland, where they did this uh, plan called the Southwest Corridor Plan that, again, I invite you to look at because they adopted a lot of the strategies, really trying to incorporate equitable development in all of their policies and strategies, um, and now actually have a, like a spin-off foundation or community organization to try to implement all of this. And then obviously thinking collaboratively, there are tons of these collaboratives popping up around, um, but people often look to um, the Purple Line Corridor in the DC metro area that has really done a cross-sectoral um, look at how do we look at affordability, preservation, gentrification um, in a larger region. So uh, that was it for me. I just wanted to give you a very high level overview, sort of preview of a lot of the work that we've done at the Urban Displacement Project and that's available um, across the country. I am happy to answer questions or engage in conversation. Need to unmute myself. Um, I'm a little curious about the, the metrics. Um, the definition given of displacement was anytime has someone has to move against their will. Mm -hmm. uh, that that seems tough. Um, I mean, if you're in a in a corridor that is very downtrodden, uh, very broken, economically non-functional, you could you could apply a word like slum to a neighborhood. Any effort to improve that neighborhood will require someone to move. Therefore, it's displacement. Therefore, it's bad. That seems like. Uh, quite a conundrum if you're unable to improve living situations for, for people there by any kind of substantial construction or, or even renovation. Is that, is that really the, the working definition? I think it is. I mean, I think our goal has been always to focus on residents and the impact of improvements on people's livelihoods. Um, and so I know that there's been, especially from transit world, you know, there's sort of this unintended consequences. Anything we do might impact people. And I think the goal of the equitable development framework is to think about how do you mitigate those consequences? How do you ensure that people are able to stay if they choose? How do you um, how do you provide them with resources, with relocation, a sufficient relocation resources or ability to move back in? There's a lot of research or a lot of uh, work, especially like on, from Hope Six projects of making sure that as you improve public housing, um, you know, that people who were previously able, living in those places are able to return. Um, so right to return policies, I know are, are things that we've looked at. Um, I know that in, in Portland, they've done a, a bunch of work um, on um, community preferences. So anytime any new development uh, or affordable housing development um, goes into certain areas, you know, people that were previously perhaps already displaced are able to move back in. So it's really thinking about, um, it's not necessarily saying we don't want improvements because that might have this impact on people, but how do we mitigate those negative impacts and how do we ensure that people who want to stay are able to stay or move back? So how do you how do you place boundaries on mitigation strategies? Because you know anything could be a cause of displacement, any kind of upgrade, transit or other, where it changes the economic situation for a given individual. Uh, just to extend David's point, you can you know you, there's displacement happening constantly. So how do you set a base level of 
there's people moving all the time for a variety of reasons. And while, you know, no project happens in a vacuum, how do you account for that base level of movement? And then yeah, how, do you I mean, bound, how do you put a boundary on, on what, is an, what, is a, what is the value of mitigation that you're willing to spend? I wish I had answers to those questions. I think those are those really challenging questions that uh, you know public agencies are are forced to make, and I think are forced to make explicit about what we value and who we value. Um, and so, I do think you know one of the things that we were advocating for with San Mateo County as they were funding this Middlefield Road was to begin by doing an inventory of who is living here. What are the current housing prices so that you get a better understanding of the baseline because often we don't have a good understanding of our baselines. Um, and I know there's a bunch of work you might want to look at um, Los Angeles has, um, you know, their, their TOD policies. Um, they have a no net loss policy. So they basically conduct an inventory and they say, we are, we are making sure that we are not losing affordable units in this upgrading process. Um, and you're, be, you're also able to um, think about like people who are being pu pushed out. How are you able to document that they were there? Or what the cause of that was? Things like that. So I would probably uh, suggest looking to LA to think about where they've actually started to implement some of these things. So think about how do you do this in practice? So you mentioned uh, historic conditions. Uh, for most of our commercial corridors, they had a height, uh, and then they have slumped into something else. So I'm wondering, you know, historic conditions could be what they were at their peak, or historic conditions could be what they are now. And if you're trying to preserve, restore, balance sort of the economic health of the corridor, I'm actually wondering, you know, which historic conditions are we talking about? Yeah, the current kind of broken, unbalanced ones, or the or the historic ones, where this is the greatest neighborhood in the in the region, right? Which one are we? Which one are we kind of aiming at there? Um, so I don't know that I would suggest either are aiming at them. I think part of it is just understanding history of a place and not saying like let's not. Um, idealize a certain time and place when a lot of people were excluded from economic pr prosperity. Um, and let, but rather to think about what do we have now, how has it been in influenced by historic policies, uh, changes in the local environment, etc. Um, and, and what has created the current conditions today, like why are we seeing what's there today? Um, while we kind of while we think about moving forward, so uh, what we what we saw what we see sometimes in certain places is like it's always focusing on right now and moving forward without a recognition of how we got here. So really, just recognizing how we got to where we're at right now, not necessarily like striving for some nostalgic time and place that is no longer. One of the things, this is Julie, one of the things I've noticed in, um, in the difficulty and empathy that I have for the team is that when, when it comes to policy, oftentimes you're talking in terms of a, a mission statement and a goal statement and um, trying to trend in a direction that you want to go. And so often um, it's really difficult to actually quantify and qualify that with a metrics of measurement um, that, that you can actually point to where you have some information that enables you to kind of evaluate options. And um, in, in the work that I do, and to your point, Miriam, it seems like realistically what you're trying to do is establish your current baseline in a way like what is my point of measurement because in order to quantify the delta between where you are and where you want to go um, it really does imply that you know where you are and that you can measure that and, and I would I would assert that that's actually today's current condition of like who's living there who's able to thrive within the current condition and then I think policy is kind of this mission statement that is taking you to the place where you want to be, which I would hope is more inclusionary and more transit-oriented development and more live, work, and shop in your own neighborhood and responsive to climate action and does not exclude 
people that actually creates an environment of inclusivity. And for me, the thing that's always been a mystery in just policy as an outsider looking in is how do you measure what you need to do to get from point A to point B if you don't know where point A is and you don't know what point B is? Like you, you really, um, I'm probably being redundant here, but you really do need to understand where you are, how many people are paying rent at what level, how many commercial businesses are operating at this rental rate, what types of goods and services are currently being provided. And then realistically, if the goal is we're going to add this transit station or we're going to complete this infrastructure relative to water and sewer and electricity, we're going to do these things that create availability for growth within this neighborhood, then knowing where you are is basically quantifying what you don't want to lose. Like if you do not want to displace a thousand people from this area that are able to pay $650 a month in rent, then what does this mission of where you're going look like that still creates inclusivity for your baseline. And um, one of the reasons my commitment to the team is to share the information from my market rate work is so you can actually demystify the development process and understand, okay, in a $20 million project that creates uh, 150 housing opportunities at a studio housing, um, how many people that are existing would be able to qualify for this project? And if this project costs X and it takes an acre and a quarter to develop, you know, um, what is the infrastructure that is necessary to actually support that type of housing? And if we know that it's a market rate transaction where equity can make a return and you can get conventional financing and you can um, incentivize just basically market rate developers to come into the area. I think then you can start to convert it from a policy to more of a math equation. Because at the end of the day, it does become math. It's to incentivize both affordable housing and market rate housing and business opportunities where people can thrive, you have to be able to measure these, these tipping points. Um, how many residents does it take to support a coffee shop where people walk up instead of drive up on their commute? You know, these are things really that can be quantified and qualified. Um, and for me, those are the questions to really ask are, where are we currently in our communities? where do we really want to go to make sure we don't exclude or displace the people that have actually made this area as safe as it can be um, to, to live and thrive in this environment. We don't want to push them out. We don't want to displace them. And then really what's the math equation that takes you from here to there? Thank you, Julie. Well Excellent said. I could, I could not have said it better. I, I think those are really challenging questions, and often we do not know where we are. We don't. Uh, you know, go to any how, any city agency and ask them, you know, how many units do you have in a certain area, at what rents. Like, maybe they have some CoStar data, but that's only capturing a certain fraction of the inventory. We don't know who's living in our units. You know, you have some general ideas, so I think getting really nitty-gritty Collecting data is really important, but also being, and it also helps us be transparent about what our values are. Like I, I remember when, um, I, I think that qu the question about what metrics is, is very important. Uh, I remember when some um, sustainable development indicators came out um, and they talked about San Jose being like the best city in the country uh, because of its economic development indicators. And, and and there was not a question about at the expense of whom, right? Why is it having such economic development? Who's been being who's being pushed out from that prosperity? Who is benefiting? Who is burdening, being burdened? And so I think being very specific and thinking about the populations that we serve and making sure that we continue serving them, uh, rather than just thinking about some long distance goalpost of an economic development goalpost without thinking about the people who are living there now um, and who may not be able to stay. 
Um, I, I think a, the data point is really uh, important here, um, and w and which data you're collecting. You know, we've got um, I'll I'll amal amalgamate a, a group of uh, uses here, but you know, we've got some apartments in Ranch Cordova that were built for airmen to live in in 1950. So they're 70 years old, uh, not very functional, got structural issues. We inspect them, get on the owners to maintain them. They're not in good shape. It's hard to keep them in good shape. It's hard to keep them economically functional. We've got um, used tire store, um, check cashing, uh, quick stop uh, bar right right next door. Um, the people in the neighborhood want a Starbucks. The local school sees 60% turnover of their kids in a given school year. So at the end of the year, they got 60% kid turnover because it's mostly kids who live in apartments and the apartments are not terribly nice and the people are typically you know moving in moving out losing their deposit whatever owners are profiting from those deposits not not able to be refunded all that sort of business is going on uh trying to get your handle on who to keep in place when six percent of the population is changing every 10 months basically is is tough um particularly if you want to serve the needs of the neighborhood which are not being served currently given their economics some economic thing has to change. Some people with higher income and more disposable income have to arrive in order to balance that local economy because it's so far tilted to the non-functional that you've in essence got a food desert, right? As, as one result, you've got an opportunity desert because um, all, the, all the kids are you know, not seeing the opportunities they would see in a more balanced situation. So trying to figure out what to preserve, what to keep and what opportunity you can provide is, is tough. And I think often for us, particularly in the Sacramento region, examples that come from Washington, D.C., where it's the highest, I think I just read, it's the highest average income in the United States now is, is the Washington, D.C. metro area, or the enormously impacted South Bay, um, th those don't necessarily translate well here. Um, that, that's, I think, challenging for all of us often to hear is, is parallels about what those sorts of extreme jurisdictions uh, are doing it doesn't we hear that all the time in the national press it's one of my pet peeves you know the whole world the little small town of 250 people should follow san jose's lead eh, not so much but the data is really important the question is what data yeah i mean I, you know i'm in chicago now same thing they don't want to hear anything about any place that's not in chicago it's how is it relevant but it is relevant in terms of how the process that they went through the data that they looked at how they're identifying their goals and standards um, you know, in your example, I, I would say, yeah, that that question of churn, um, you know, people having high mobility rates because of poverty, I think is one that really needs to be um, dug into quite a bit, right? Um, and there's been a lot of research on gentrification displacement where people are like, oh, well, gentrification doesn't lead to displacement because people are churning all the time. Well, I think that you are seeing high levels of displacement of a population uh, often because of poverty and inability to pay rent and thinking about stabilizing them, right? I'm sure that the schools want to stabilize this population. How do you serve yes. kids when they're turning every year in and out? So really thinking about what does it take to really stabilize that population so that they, you can serve them, right? How do you serve a population when it's constantly moving? Um, and so I think really digging into that, thinking about, you know, what's causing these high rates of evictions, what needs to be in place in terms of, is it workforce development? Um, is it tenant protections? Do we need to do some sort of universal section eight? Like how are we stabilizing people's housing? Cause it's keeping them in cycles of poverty. Um, I think sometimes it can be overwhelming when we're trying to address everything, which some often is the place when we're off, especially doing place-based work. So sometimes drilling down into a specific population uh, can be helpful and kind of focusing as well. Miriam, I had a question. I was wondering if you could go in a little more saying this is really valuable and sort of going back a little bit on the metrics piece. Um, is the role of sort of the local collaborative and you mentioned the purple line corridor, corridor collaborative, which I know is a DC example, but we have examples in California where the role of local residents businesses is so central in providing some of the intangible um, data and metrics. Um, 
And I'm thinking of example in Sacramento, Franklin Boulevard um, is a grantee of ours um, that's had a really strong neighborhood association role in doing that work. Um, so I do think there are examples. So I was wondering if there are other types of models like that where I think sort of building from the ground up as well as kind of the top down metrics collection can support this because I do think that we're serving the community, but we also have to work with the community. And so how does that play out? Yes, um, 100%. And I would say, especially like top down data often is not very good. Uh, right. So you do have to do a lot of that data collection on the ground. And that's something at the Urban Displacement Project. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's tedious, but there's so much that can, I think can also be accomplished by working with the community in collecting local data. Um, and there's some really good research out of UC Berkeley on like the health benefits and the community organizing benefits and, you know, on, on sometimes like data and workforce training uh, work if, when you get community collecting their own data and, and um, generating their own information. Um, I will say one group that I, um, I know Ebaldsi, I believe, out of the East Bay um, did some work on the San Pablo corridor uh, in Oakland. And they had a, an initiative called Spark, I believe, and I don't remember the, how they spelled it. I just remember that it was Spark because I work on an initiative called Spark. So I remember think, getting confused. Um, and I think that they did a ton of community organizing as part of that, and that might be a good um, starting point to look at. Apologies, it's in the East Bay. San Pablo Corridor is really disinvested. I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, it might, might, it's a little closer to home than um, some of these other ones. All right, other questions? If not, I think we have uh, Dov Caden with us. Yes? I'm going to pop off. Thanks, everyone. It was great to talk to you. Oh, Bye. you're going to go. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. Thank you. I am calling Dov in right now. Uh, all right, there we go. Hi there, can everybody hear me? Yes, yeah. welcome. All right, so thank you. I think you, you I have some anti-displacement for... strategies you were going to uh, talk to us about. Um, I do, I'll... I do. Go right ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I uh, apologize for, for calling in uh, internet outage in the neighborhood, um, but thank you so much to, to Miriam for, for introducing um, this subject and you know, obviously, as we as we work to to transform our our older commercial corridors, it's it's so important that we're you know looking to ensure that we're investing in these places. We obviously want the investment, um, but we don't, we don't want to displace the existing residents and the businesses that are already there. So um, yeah, now that we're a little bit warmed up to to the topic, I, I wanted to take just a few minutes to um, expand on the the outline of draft tools and strategies that were included in your packets. So that outline is it's very much a, a work in progress. It's in no way an exhaustive list. I think some of the things actually in Miriam's presentation can probably be added in and from the discussion, but um, it's a start to, to building a, a menu of policy levers that can help to, to mitigate the potential unintended consequences that, that Miriam did speak about. I also just wanna be upfront that this is um, not a topic area that SACOG has historically delved into, but um, I think building off of the work that we're doing with the board equity, race, and working group, uh, race and inclusion working group, excuse me. It's, it's something that, you know, we want to increasingly discuss and consider. So the, the outline that we have divides up the potential tools and strategies into six different buckets. Um, there's obviously quite a few ways to, to slice these things, but this is sort of just the framework that we put together. Um, so those buckets are natural affordability, uh, subsidized affordable housing production, tenant protections, economic gardening, preservation, and public processes. So I'm gonna to briefly touch on each topic and an example policy from that topic, um, but I'm hoping that the task force will provide feedback and, and reactions to, um, to really anything in the toolkit so we can continue to hone this list moving forward. So we called the first bucket natural affordability, but this is um, really about all of the different policies that this group has already been discussing um, that, that make it easier and cheaper to build infill multifamily housing. So, so everything from 
uh, moving to more buy right approval processes to, um, as, as Julie was talking about, changing how we assess fees uh, from a per unit to a per square foot basis. Um, you know, the larger point is that making it easier to build smaller, more, more naturally attainable multifamily housing um, eases pressure on existing units and actually can help to, to stem displacement pressures, particularly um, if you do some of these, these uh, reductions of barriers in the super high demand, high opportunity neighborhoods that um, historically have not, have not allowed new housing. And so that has sort of um, shifted some of the demand and some of the um, uh, construction to, to sort of lower income neighborhoods. The second bucket is about uh, building capital A affordable housing through subsidy. You know, this is obviously uh, important because there's, there's always going to be a segment of the population for which uh, new housing, even, even the small uh, multifamily housing that we're talking about, uh, will not be affordable without subsidy. And um, many of the policies in, in the natural affordability bucket um, make it easier to, to build subsidized affordable housing, but, but ultimately this is, this is sort of about money, right? It's about finding the, the money to subsidize the lower rents on these projects. And this is particularly challenging in, in California where it's exceedingly difficult, as you all know, to, for, for local governments to, to raise revenue. So many jurisdictions um, will look to things like impact fees, to things like inclusionary zoning, um, which, are, which are politically popular and, and can actually be effective if the goal is purely just um, you know, finding, finding money for, for affordable housing. But they also do sometimes raise um, concerns about increasing the, the price of the non-subsidized units. So one interesting strategy for, for raising uh, local money for affordable housing is a um, progressive real estate transfer fee, which uh, essentially is a, a property value or a, a sale value based fee that's assessed when you sell your single family home. And all jurisdictions already do this in California, but in a pretty uh, minimal way. What's interesting is that if, if you sort of choose to go down this route and increase that fee, you can do so in a progressive manner. So you would have higher fees um, per $1,000 of, of sale value if the house is sold for over a certain amount. So um, you know, that might be a, a creative way to fund affordable housing in um, perhaps a more equitable way than, than a, a sales tax or, or taxing new development. The third is uh, tenant protections, which is a, a critical one to ensure that the, the most vulnerable renters are, are stabilized and um, supported as our communities do inevitably change. Um, one of the key tenant protections, especially right now, um, for keeping people in their homes is just cause eviction policies. And this is basically a catch-all phrase for policies that prevent landlords from evicting tenants unless there is a, a just cause, like um, violating the lease, for example. Many of the, the basic protections were, were guaranteed actually statewide last year by um, a bill, AB uh, 1482, but there were a variety of exemptions to that bill. So for example, the just cause provisions only applied to homes that were over 15 years old and they, they did not apply to single family rentals, which um, actually make up a, a decent amount of um, the Sacramento region's uh, rental stock. So local governments can actually look to, to plug this hole through a local just cause eviction ordinance. Fourth is economic gardening and commercial displacement prevention, which is a, um, a term that, that we talk about in the, the SACOG economic prosperity strategy. Uh, but in this context, we're, we're talking about policies and strategies that, um, that build capacity from, from within and, and support the existing businesses on these corridors so that you know, when we do revitalize, again, we aren't displacing the businesses that are already there. And one of the strategies here would be to create a, a local business preference program, which would um, essentially provide preference for, for existing local businesses to, to occupy space in development in which the, the local government is an owner or a partner. So if you had a, um, you know, say an affordable mixed use project where, uh, there were, um, you know, public dollars going in, you would be looking to fill the commercial space with a business from the area rather than maybe like a, a sort of corporate chain type thing. The, um, 
the fifth bucket is preservation, which is about trying to, to track and preserve um, affordable housing whose affordability term is set to expire, right? So um, affordable house, like when you have a subsidized project, there's a term, you know, usually 55 years um, if, it's, if it's funded through um, low-income housing tax credit, but sometimes it's shorter if it's, if it's funded um, through some other source. Local governments can actually enact um, affordable housing preservation policies that, that require owners of regulated rental housing like that to follow really specific procedures in advance of the affordability period expiring. And um, so sometimes that could include like a, a right of first refusal for governments um, and, and community land trusts and things like that to actually match the sale of a contract. Um, so they're, they sort of have the, the, um, the ability to, to preserve those units that, that would just be kind of be renovated and potentially um, jacked up in the prices. Uh, and then the final bucket is in public pol um, public processes, and and this one is really aimed at building greater participation, uh, accountability, transparency into local land use decision making. And one of the bigger points in this category is being just more clear about how the public can can most effectively participate in the planning process. And this is especially important, right, as we're talking about um, sort of shifting our development and review processes to more of a buy right one. Um, you know, and, and one way to, to, to do this is to provide a public participation plan. And so that's one of the strategies in this bucket that, that describes a jurisdiction's commitment to providing uh, this transparent process. It outlines you know, what projects are, are subject to public input. Um, it provides best practices for, for developers that are you know, seeking entitlement approval for, for how best to engage. And, and really, you know, most importantly, just provides information on where, when, and how the public can provide comments to decision makers on projects. So, so those are some of the draft policies and strategies that, that we have identified that are out there. Would love to hear thoughts or just discussion around any of these. We, we definitely recognize that um, not all of these policies are appropriate everywhere. Um, but we did want to, to just get the discussion started around some of the options at the local level I know time is limited here today, but you know, if you wanted to, to sleep on any of these and provide comments to SACOG staff um, this month, we can uh, absolutely uh, incorporate that as we begin to sort of pull together this final draft. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Director Sander. Thanks. Uh, committee Task Force members, rather, have you come across any of these strategies and uh, in your work? And uh, were they positive, negative, effective, non-effective? Any, any comments like that? Well, yeah, this is uh, Mike Stretch with the BIA. I, you know, this is, this is fascinating, good information. Um, I think that um, from a builder's perspective, we always have um, a very open mind and um, willingness to explore new opportunities uh, to address the challenges that we have in this area because they're vast and they're growing and, um, and we need to be creative. My, my only thought is that we just need to be extremely cautious as it relates to subsidized affordable housing. Um, as was stated early on in the conversation, um, really the solution to um, this quandary that, that we're faced with in California and throughout the nation is primarily uh, the route out of it is market rate housing and attainable market rate housing, um, which we had a perfect example of that. Um, you know, earlier today that's that's being launched here in the not so distant future. By placing those inclusionary housing policies and fees onto those existing uh, free market um, projects, um, it, it simply creates additional um, um, challenges for those builders who are actually solving the problem. So um, this is complex and it can't be addressed as, um, as was mentioned a second ago, you know, in, in and five minute increments, um, but it is extremely important, particularly in California where we have extremely high fees to be very sensitive towards that because these market rate builders who are really, in my mind, um, very well aligned to be able to um, help with this, these production numbers over the long haul um, get spooked very easily when it comes to um, terminology like inclusionary fees. So I would just kind of throw that out there as something that we need to be um, aware of. 
and cognizant of as we move forward with these discussions. Very good points. Um, I have uh, questions about the uh, economic gardening. You know, the example I gave earlier was uh, pretty realistic in Ranch Cordova. You, I can imagine an old apartment complex with a tire store, used tire store, a bar, uh, a liquor store, and um, um, uh, auto repair in a given location. And of those, I'm not sure which are really critical to the community. Uh, maybe the bar is the most critical to the community there. I, I'm not sure. But if you but if you're gonna you know reinvent, restore, uplift, balance that segment, I don't know if you want to save the used tire store, right? So how do you how do you decide this is a value and this is not in terms of that economic gardening? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. I think it, you know, that's, it's sort of a, a key question, obviously, and it's something that every local government is going to have to sort of decide for themselves. I'm not sure there's like a standardized, like equitable answer to that question that sort of is one size fits all. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, again, it's, it's something that each local government is really going to have to grapple with of like, what are the businesses that they um, are really trying to sort of protect and, and make sure they're not displacing. Well, I would add to that, uh, this is Julie, because one of the things I think that we're talking about is um, gentrification. And I think in some regards, it matters who owns that tire store. You know, if this is a business that's a family owned business that's owned by a, a, a person of color who has established themselves in this neighborhood and, and is creating a viable living and jobs for others within the community, you know, to displace someone um, that's worked so hard to have a foothold in a community to me seems like a sad thing to do. I feel a little less empathetic if it's a chain, but again, you know, the jobs, who are they employing in that neighborhood? And, and I think you kind of have a twofold thing happening here with regard to um, the challenge of not letting gentrification continue to exacerbate and not solve the problem of vulnerable communities and this increase in um, homelessness and, and actually just pushing uh, what people perceive to be the issue further and further away from uh, this core. And so I think this comes back to kind of the measurement of who and what and where makes up this existing community and how are you providing an offset to ensure that you really are not um, excluding what you hope to have as inclusivity in your communities. I think that's a great point, Julie. And, and I, if I could just add in, I think, um, you know, what, uh, what I've sort of been hearing, uh, especially in the last discussion, is really an emphasis on trying to understand, you know, what that baseline is and, and just get better data, essentially, about what, you know, what are the potential risks for displacement in terms of businesses and residences. So, um, you know, one of the things that we can definitely add into our toolkit is, is sort of looking at things like a social equity indicators baseline analysis or you know there, there's a lot of different terms for this i think equity impact assessment that's another one that i've sort of heard batted around out there um, but just try to to include in this toolkit um, you know tools and strategies that we can um, make and, and plans that we can look at to try to assess what that baseline actually looks like so it seems like that's key okay if there are any other questions, comments? If not, I think that was a great lead into our next topic, which is the main product of this task force, a policymaker toolkit. Um, let's see, we've got a draft that has been circulated. I think everyone probably saw that, has been circulated. Um, we're hoping to give some feedback today to our staff at SACOG about those tools. So policymakers, do you have feedback on the toolkit as you have seen it? Or staff, do you want to give us any framing of the of the toolkit at this point? 
Uh, Jennifer Hargrove has prepared a presentation oh, excellent. this item. Yep. Good morning. Um, I'll keep it, keep it brief because you all did get um, the draft strategies that are in the toolkit um, with the mail out. But we did want to just give a quick preview and overview of some of these because um, as Chair Sander just said, we are putting this together based on the work and the discussions that have been happening at this committee. And the toolkit really will be aimed at policymakers to um, offer strategies for how we can overcome some of these challenges with revitalizing these areas. I will say this toolkit does assume that much of the planning work has been done, that the corridor has a vision or a plan in place and has already been through that um, initial community engagement process. So the toolkit does not cover that. The tools and strategies that we've identified here are for the corridors that really have that vision in place um, already and then now are finding themselves with, with now what, right? How do, we, how do we implement this? How do we get this vision moving? Um, and you'll recall from our first meeting together that we discussed many of these barriers to corridor revitalization and infill development. And we had this chart and the, dis the committee discussed it. We added barriers to it. And the committee actually started to rank these challenges so that we could begin to uncover um, where the biggest challenges exist. And since then, we've had great discussions about these challenges and even began at our last meeting talking about some of the solutions. So the toolkit um, and the draft strategies really is a combination of those discussions and building on our existing uh, resources and research. So for today, we've organized the draft toolkit into these same topical areas. Um, so connecting back to your first meeting and I'll just briefly present on them in this um, order as well. I won't review them all, um, all of the strategies that were provided to you um, in your mail out packet, but I will highlight a few from each of these topic areas. Starting first with the infrastructure tools and strategies. Um, first on the list of strategies, though they're not in any particular order, is to identify, analyze, and quantify all of the infrastructure needs. Sometimes when we're planning, um, we focus on the land uses and the above ground transportation infrastructure needs, which are important, but equally important is understanding what is needed below ground in order to support the infill development on that corridor. This can help prioritize needed upgrades, but also create a more predictable environment for um, fees in the development community as well. Another strategy is to consider if there are ways to increase neighborhood connections. Oftentimes, um, a lot of planning goes into the corridor itself, but what about the connections between the corridor and the adjacent community that supports it? You had a great discussion at the last meeting about sort of the, the ecosystem of the corridor and how heavily it relies on the adjacent community and how that community is relying on that corridor. So how well does the current corridor plan and vision integrate that community and how might you improve those neighborhood connections? One way to better understand that and also just better understand how the corridor is being traveled today might be to do a bike and walk audit. What is it like to bike or walk on this corridor? Um, now I chose a particularly challenging photo here to illustrate the concept, but, but even in an area that might have had recent streetscaping or a complete streets improvements, actually walking and biking the area will help you understand what might be impeding the people traffic that we want on these corridors. And then with so much changing in the transportation realm, another infrastructure strategy might be a mobility hub. How can you center the user experience and provide a wide range of transportation options, not just to and from the corridor, but on the corridor? So a mobility hub is, is one idea. And then I'll move through the other categories a, a little bit quicker. We actually talked about regulatory and process a bit already. And also at your last, last meeting, you had a presentation from DAV on many of these strategies already. The first few being about moving, uh, removing some of the process like by right approvals for housing or developments that are consistent with zoning. 
Um, but coordinating with outside agencies uh, and special districts uh, regularly can also help bring that certainty and consistency to the process. And the last strategy I'll touch on in this regulatory bucket um, is to reduce or remove parking minimums. Dov presented on this again at your last meeting, but we know that zoning has these hidden barriers in it, right? When you take an infill lot and you layer on lot coverage requirements and setback requirements and parking requirements, you can sometimes unintentionally really squeeze the buildable area right out of the parcel. So moving into the strategies for costs, uh, reducing costs and fees. Um, and again, I'll just highlight a few, but you have the full list and the materials that were sent to you. But we talked about this last time too, um, and it came up again today a couple times already, so I'll breeze through it here. But you know, one idea being, if you wanna increase housing in the corridor, um, you might consider changing from a, a per, per square foot per unit fee structure to a per square footage fee. Um, we can better incentivize infill housing, particularly multi-unit developments, if the per unit fees are not the same as they are for the very large you know, single family new home. A similar concept might be to structure fees by location or pilot a fee reduction in the corridor that you're trying to incentivize development on. And then Finally, even if you can't reduce fees, the transparency about what the fees are, as well as any additional conditions of approval, would still be very important um, and helpful for the development of the corridor. The last two categories from our original worksheet that we um, have about the barriers was market and social factors. But at our last meeting, we really discussed how housing is playing such a large role in these two areas. So many of the solutions here are around how to get more housing in and around the corridor to essentially get more people in the corridor. So you'll see a few of the strategies we've already talked about already get repeated here because sometimes, you know, one solution or strategy could be helpful with a few of the different challenges. There was a lot of overlapping challenges we had in that original worksheet. Um, one market strategy would be to find ways to activate those vacant spaces that the corridors have today and then change your code or your policies to actually allow for that type of temporary use, right? It doesn't take a lot to activate a, a parking lot or a vacant lot, you know, some lights or a picnic table. Um, and then thinking right now too about the pandemic and how many businesses are needing outdoor space just to stay in business. So how can we um, temporarily utilize some of these underutilized spaces on the corridor and help get um, more activity happening there? Another market strategy is to consider the neighborhoods adjacent to the corridor and what can be done to support the increased housing in these neighborhoods. Um, allowing and encouraging ADUs and missing middle products like fourplexes can help increase activity on the corridor and again contribute to this, that ecosystem that we talked about at the last meeting. And these product types can fit within existing single family neighborhoods if we consider regulating the building form or the envelope rather than the density that's allowed. And finally, um, in corridors that have accessible and frequent transit supporting transit oriented development, specifically you know, higher densities and housing in close proximity to the station is also a critical strategy. Um, that's just a quick overview of the draft toolkit. It does not address all of the challenges facing commercial corridor revitalization. It is targeted at those challenges that have risen to the top in our discussions with this committee. Um, and also the ones that local agencies can have some influence over. But there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach, as we heard today through the um, gentrification and displacement discussions as well. Even things like mobility hubs, you know, TOD, missing middle, these are all things that are context and corridor sensitive. So where possible within the toolkit, we will try to offer that guidance of the types of corridor conditions that each strategy would work best for um, and or explain the strategy with enough context that local agencies can evaluate 
whether or not this might fit their specific need. Um, and then as Dov mentioned and just presented on, we will be finalizing and really folding in a discussion about gentrification and displacement and those strategies um, into the toolkit as well so that we have just sort of one cohesive document. And we plan to finalize that um, toolkit itself and prepare a, a polished draft for you, hopefully in advance of your next meeting. And then I will turn it back to um, Chair Sander. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, definitely looking for any feedback that you have at this time, um, but would be willing to take that, you know, over the next few weeks as well. If, if something hits you, you know, after our meeting today, you can reach out to Monica and we'll definitely be interested in that feedback. Okay, colleagues, uh, any feedback on this toolkit? Things that might make it more effective or things that are missing? Things that you'd like to emphasize or just any comments? Let me start by apologizing that I always have a comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, Julie. That's why you're here. Yeah. Well, one of the things I really would love to emphasize for the group is frequently when we're talking about housing, we're really, really addressing the rental market. And frankly, if you really want to help balance out um, the equity, you, you re we've really got to challenge ourselves to find ways for people to own homes because building absolutely. generational wealth is absolutely key to really lifting up every community. Um, and then a concept that's really been occurring to me as I've been working on this, this project um, to basically put these eight single family homes in the hands of um, some folks here locally has been just the dearth of recognition of creative capital and how, you know, the very people that are the most um, creative and intelligent and thoughtful and hardworking who really bring great skill and interest to our communities are frequently the folks that don't have under commercial banking terms, you know, the financial statement and balance sheet to try to bring forth a business or an idea. And I think in, in our communities, if we can find a way to really emphasize and elevate creative capital, the fact that people have this ingrained um, skill set where they can bring something meaningful and interesting to our community, that that frankly has so much more value than balance sheet. And I can share with you that I, I realize Urban Elements is a very small development company. We only have 10 retail spaces. And I can share with you that through COVID, we only lost one tenant. And the one tenant that we lost, we were able to immediately replace. One of the reasons we were able to do so is we ensure that we, when we build out a retail space for our user, we do not leave them with debt. We include the, the turnkey build out, including oftentimes their kitchen equipment and things like this within the lease rate so that they have one fee that they need to pay not multiple levels of fee and they're not burdened and up at night worrying about debt. Um, I felt like, and I realize COVID is nowhere over, but we work with really small local operators. I have never asked a tenant for a balance sheet. I really only want to know what they're able to bring and deliver to our community that kind of elevates and lifts up our community and creates interest and a sense of place. So um, I just wanted to share those two things with you. They, they're revealing themselves to be incredibly important in the work that we're doing. That's, it's interesting. Um, several of us here, I think, serve on the GSAC board, the Greater Sacramento Economic Development Corporation, where the goal is to bring jobs uh, from other regions here that are choosing to relocate as well as grow our own. And often we get an outsider's view of Sacramento. And one of the things they came in and told us about Sacramento was that our capital, the people who are investing in real estate here in Sacramento are extremely conservative in what they do. You know, like there's nothing built on spec. There's very little done sort of on the edges. There just wasn't a lot of, as you would just, as you just put it, sort of uh, creative capital investments going on. It was only something that's absolutely proven with very little risk. Am I willing to put part of my family fortune into this sort of, that was the normal for investment in Sacramento. And so they pointed out to us, and this is sort of like the CEOs and the political leadership of the region, we've got to change that culture. 
because that doesn't allow anything creative <laughs> to happen. That was, uh, that was a very interesting comment. And how we as policymakers can promote that is also an interesting question. Uh, a lot of these tools sort of, I think, get to the edges of it. Um, but I, I don't know there's a clear button to push there. Uh, maybe talking about it more. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. That's an interesting point. But the acknowledged problem on, uh, on several levels. Well, while I was mentioning GSAC, I'll mention something else. You know, Brookings did this study of us as a region. What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? And one of the weaknesses they came back with, which we did not really publicize very much, it turns out, was how many regulatory agencies are involved per 100,000 people. Um, they had this metric nationwide. <laughs> Uh, National, James, you might remember the number. I think the number was, it's something like six nationwide, you know, like six governments per 100,000 people uh, on average. In Sacramento, you want to guess what that number is? 180. <laughs> <laughs> it's 21. <laughs> 21, one of the worst they've seen anywhere in the country in terms of number of government agencies. <laughs> which I mean for our purposes each one of those is a potential barrier to getting something done right each one of those has their own requirements their own goals their own objectives so as i looked at this toolkit that's that's one of the things i look for it's kind of in here you know facilitate with regulatory bodies but you know if we were if we were going to continue this work next year in some form i think i would put that on the list saying you know we ought to get some of those 21 per 100,000 governments together and figure out how we knock down these economic barriers along the corridors so that you don't have the sewer district killing every single deal on my Folsom Boulevard. David, Other I think I think it would be interesting to, um, to, to sort of try and synthesize all that Julie said into an argument that maybe there is a missing middle, but it's actually developers with the right goals and modest objectives. You know, um, it, it could be that we do have a whole suite of people that are very conservative and are always looking to hit a home run. Um, but if they're really sincere about their desire to build community, you have to take the approach that Julie was describing, so. Well, in defense of our community and, and frankly, even our development community, let me just say that for every one of these projects that I undertake, I'm personally guaranteeing that project to the lender. So I completely understand why they are very risk averse. They, they don't get to just have the audacity to build a project. They risk losing their retirement, their home, everything to bring the project forward. So I do, I really do feel like as this group continues, and I, I would really love to get more input from the BIA too, that we really kind of need to pull back the curtain on everything that is this no. This group has done such a remarkable job like identifying barriers, but that's news to me that there's 21 agencies that probably 80% of what they want is a common denominator. And how much easier would it be if you could just take all the common denominators and hit those metrics and then only deal with the outliers as opposed to feeling like you have to get 21 yeses before you can get something done. So I feel like the benefit of this group is that you continue to pull back the curtain, the mystery of the development process, the mystery of the reg regulatory process, and that as we find common denominators, you will actually make this entire process simpler, more profitable, and more accessible to everybody. Well, said. would you and actually, Mike, I just did the math. So uh, if we've got, you know, 1.4, 1.5 million people and 21 governments per 100,000, that's like on the order of 300,000 government. I mean, I'm sorry, 300 governments <laughs> in our region. So you're, you're oh, I not understand. Really, really that far off. Oh, and how many are engaged in a specific corridor? That, that's also an interesting list, you know. I, I'm guessing it's almost 10, somewhere around there. Monica, it sounds like we have a map for you to make. <laughs> Who has a stake in each one of the corridors we're looking at? I think so. You got a map, 300 government agencies in there. 
<laughs> and their charges and responsibilities. And that's just Sacramento County I was talking about. I don't know. We've thrown everybody else. Woo! My goodness. Uh, other comments on the toolkit? I, I thought, um, you know, the one thing I don't know if it's missing or, um, or I keep thinking about what you kind of started with, David, about the market and uh, the private sector and, and assuring um, uh, opportunity entry points uh, uh, for, for young entrepreneurs and, and, and innovative uh, uh, uses of, of, our, of our corridors. Um, and so I think in my mind at the policymaker as a city council member as a mayor is how do we create how do we encourage creative uses in spaces because right now our, our codes may be just outdated in, in what the future is going to uh, look like and how how retail spaces are going to be used in the future uh, how they might have multiple uses for not only residents but uh, for housing and maybe other things uh, for entertainment, whatever that may look like. So how do we create this flexibility uh, within our commercial corridors that will allow entry uh, into these new markets that are going to be opened up and make sure that young people, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, it could be a racial and equity question is how do we get young people from all across, um, you know, gender and, and race to kind of start um, participating in, in these older quarters to say this is how I want to use it but you you the, our current code just creates some you know a lot of barriers and I know that's we talked about codes but it's almost like we have to reimagine our uses where there's micro manufacturing in some of our older buildings to uh, you know multiple use and stuff and infill or just you know spaces that are being used totally different so um, it's almost like um, I think it was a, a the Metro Chamber put together a presentation on what the future uh, with the pandemic and how it's accelerated uh, the market and different things in the future, how things are going to work and how are we going to do transactions and buy things and uh, live and entertain ourselves. I think I think we start we have to kind of think in that way so then we can get the investment folks to feel like, OK, uh, this is how the future is going to go. Let's start investing in there. And that's how we get new people. Uh, and divert, you know, to in a, a created more inclusive uh, corridors uh, instead of just thinking housing, residential, mixed use. There's probably going to be five or six or seven, maybe multiple uses that could that same space can be used uh, for. So it just made me think about um, that we need to start thinking about if we're going to create inclusion, how do we get young entrepreneurs to kind of enter the market and how do we get the financial system to to feel comfortable to uh, pilot some programs to transform some of our corridors in a way that is going to allow for for that to be used, uh, you know, whether it's five or 10 or 20 years from now. Good comments. Yeah, I remember uh, Julie and Deanna, maybe at our last session, maybe it was the first one, I'm not, I'm not sure, talking about the, the need to create an economy sort of on the ground, in the place, in the corridor, without thinking that you're creating a destination here. You know that you can't you can't revitalize a corridor and, and fix everything by assuming you're going to get people from the outside coming in spending money. You've got to think about putting enough people on the ground to create their own local environment, healthy, balanced, functional environment, rather than thinking the outside is going to somehow fix this if I just build the Taj Mahal of some kind there. Um, and also thinking about the small project, right? The small making, this is what Julie said, I know, the small making things beautiful and interesting and giving texture to a place as opposed to the giant that public agencies are often after, uh, you know, wanting to do the giant project. So I think it's um, reflecting those ideas in this toolkit are, are probably important from an education point of view, because um, most of us, I think, in local office, and I can say my jurisdiction right now, talking about the civic center process that is not well named, um, are thinking about big things. Let's do this big thing, as opposed to let's knock down all the barriers that are stopping the little things, or how do we even promote the little things? Promote all the little infill spaces, and, and what's, the, what's the sequence of that? You know, do you need the big things so that the little things can thrive around it? You know, the sort of, that sort of mechanistic to-do list, I think, would be a value to our uh, to our peers, particularly on those ideas that aren't really, you know, 
common in, in thinking about. It's interesting to see the, the one of the images of the infrastructure underneath the streets, which is very important. Uh, but as we move forward, the infrastructure is really going to be on the cloud or whatever it may be that it might not need uh, some of those investments. I'm not saying that we're not going to need sewer and water storm drains and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. It just it just made me think about even having infrastructure so we can have uh, things like uh, um, you know I don't I don't know. Just made me think of like the infrastructure might not be look exactly like it is. And I know we're talking about the uh, um, uh, green means go and and some of that try investments, but is is it going to be? Um, I don't know. It just made me think like maybe maybe that infrastructure doesn't have to look that way. Maybe there's going to be other means in the future or how to use our facilities and stuff. We'll yeah. Still, yeah. I think that's a, a great point, Ricky. And I'll tell a, a tale slightly out of school. Um, we have this District 11 government structure in the growth area of Ranch Cordova, and its job was to assign uh, a cost to building a new home for drainage, District 11. And we tried to take it over when we first became the city, couldn't do it, litigation got delayed until this year. This year, we finally got into District 11, looked at the books, and figured out that Sac County, in operating that thing, was overcharging our builders and our residents um, $4,500 to $5,000 per unit for drainage costs, in part because they built it with big old cement ditches in the plan, and they had huge administrative costs associated with that. So for 15 years, because we haven't been able to get our hands on this thing because of litigation, we have been throwing away 4,500 bucks, 5,000 bucks. Our residents are paying for that. I mean, it's tens of millions of dollars now that have gone down basically a, a rat hole <laughs> with no benefit that we can see other than maybe an employment program for somebody. So I don't know. Um, and the drainage that that thing was predicated on, the style, totally out of date. Totally out of date. So... Yeah, I think you've got, and that's it's also connects back to all these different agencies, right? There, there are better, smarter ways to do things, and if you're not on top of it in these corridors, those things, those old ideas will kill you. Well, all, the, all that government you talked about, all these districts that want to kind of maintain the status quo, and um, they're not looking for efficiencies or ways to kind of move forward and, and, and look into the future. Um, I mean, like like you said, I think in, in Yuba County we have for a county of 70,000 people. I think we have five uh, uh, fire departments. Uh, you know, uh, we have uh, OPA, we have Linda Fire. I mean, we have we have a tons of government that we have to go through depending on, you know, where you live and who you have to deal with and stuff. So um, those barriers are true, but a lot of these um, agencies might not have the incentive to modernize and move forward and to kind of a futuristic look into things. So do you really need that big pipe? Um, yeah. All right, other comments on the toolkit? Great job. I would just really like to encourage the team to stay together, don't get discouraged, find the common denominators in every one of these things we're discussing because you can get really worn out in your positions, specifically as public servants, like don't give up. It's a fight worth fighting it can be solved. And I think what happens is as you find these common denominators, like you look at, for example, the 21 agencies and you say, what is the 80% that they have in common? How do we create a single checklist of the 80% that they have in common and then address the outliers? What you're doing is you're saying yes to 80% of it and then you are tackling the things that are specific to the project or specific to the agency. When you're talking about things like um, Ricky's raising with regard to how adaptable and creative can we make these spaces? Well, when you're looking at codes and it's very different for housing and it's very different for multifamily, it's very different for commercial, you know, how do you take these things, find the common denominators, address them, and let space be as robust and flexible as possible so that you're not perpetually paying for and adapting uh, to change or a, a, a different code variation because someone now wants to be able to uh, cut hair in what used to be their residence, but they're on a commercial corridor, but because of the way the building's zoned, you know, it's going to be a whole bunch of fees to just basically do this simple conversion. 
there's so much that you guys can do to really identify these common denominators and use that as a starting point um, to understand where you're beginning and where you want to go. You can measure the middle if you know those two things. So I just hope you guys don't give up. I think this is super important work you're doing. All right, any other comments? Very good. Well, we have a very short update on uh, REAP and the Green Zone. So these are housing update issues. And Jennifer, is that you? Yep, that's me. Um, and the Green Zones and Green Means Go is so applicable to what we were just talking about um, as we're continuing that process, we've been meeting with many of these different agencies and special districts and trying to be like, you know, how are you doing your fees and, and how do you plan? And, and it really is um, uncovering quite a bit. Um, so I'll start there with a quick update on, on Green Means Go. Um, you'll recall that um, as one of SACOG's primary responsibilities is to create um, and implement our long range transportation plan, the Metro Metropolitan Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy. Um, that plan has to meet many state and federal requirements and, and achieves many shared regional goals, one of which is our um, greenhouse gas reduction of 19% that we're trying to achieve by uh, 2035. And one of the primary strategies that we have for trying to achieve that target is Green Means Go. It is a strategy about accelerating infill development and then within these infill areas layering on transportation options and electric vehicle infrastructure and programs. It is designed to be a place based investment strategy. So um, that's where the green zones come in right. What are the places that we want to prioritize and invest in and see that increased infill growth happening. So uh, just about a week ago, the SACOG board approved a framework for establishing the green zones. And just yesterday, we launched the green zone nomination process. Basically, we're asking cities and counties throughout the region to collaborate with partners and stakeholders and all of these other public agencies um, to identify and nominate green zones within their jurisdictions. The green zone requirements, uh, again, just for what we're trying to promote, they, they have to be in an infill area, which in our region is, is a very vast, um, large area. It's not just like a downtown. It's um, in large part, many of the cities and counties, they all have infill areas. And literally all of the commercial corridors that we've talked about at this task force, the downtowns, the main streams, those are all definitely eligible areas. Um, so over the next couple months, we're hoping to work with the local agencies and establish this regional set of green zones by December. And although we don't have funding secured for Green Means Go, we're still very um, actively going to be working on that and continuing those efforts. And so any future Green Means Go funding we get, Green Means Go funding that we would get would be targeted at these green zones. And then I'll quickly give the REAP update and happy to take questions on either. But REAP is the Regional Early Action Planning Funds. It's approximately $6.7 million that's coming directly to SACOG from the state, from the Housing and Community Development Department. They're one-time funds to support regional efforts to support housing planning and the acceleration of housing development. Back in June, the board adopted a framework for how we will spend these funds. Um, most notable and worth mentioning for this group, um, we are allocating up to $600,000 to support the teams from our Civic Lab Year 2. That was our Civic Lab process that we went through um, last year that was focused on commercial corridors. So where those participating jurisdictions and teams identified housing um, related activities as solutions or par part of the solution for their corridors. We're going to be using some of the REAP funds to support those teams and their planning efforts. Um, additionally, we'll be setting up a non-competitive grant program for housing planning in infill areas. So jurisdictions 
um, will be allocated a, a certain amount of funding based on the regional housing needs um, allocation that we also went through earlier this year. And then they can use these funds for a wide range of housing related activities, many of which we talked about today. You can use them to go through the process to change your fee structure. You can use them for rezoning parcels. Um, you can use these funds to change your development review process, do a specific plan, do the infrastructure study. Um, all of these things would be eligible activities with the REAP funds. And then finally, connecting it back to green zones, we are going to be using approximately $1.7 million of the REAP funds to support planning work in those green zones specifically after they've been um, through the process and adopted later this year. That way we can continue to ready these green zones um, and be ready for any future uh, Green Means Go infrastructure funds that may come to the region. So that's the quick quick update on those two. Happy to answer any questions about either of those programs. All right, very good. Any questions or comments? All right, we are about ready to adjourn. I just want to let you know about our next steps. So staff obviously have been listening to our feedback and discussion today. Uh, there'll be some modifications, I think, to the toolkit, and they're going to bring back a final document at our next meeting, which is Monday, November the 16th. Monday, November the 16th is our next meeting. We are also going to provide an update to the Land Use and Natural Resources Committee at SACOG this Thursday, and I think they meet at 1. Uh, is that right, James? Is it 1 o'clock? 1 30. 1 30. On Thursday. So we'll have that update at that point. Uh, the uh, things we talked about in addition, and the reference I made to things we might do next year, I think could develop between now and November. If there are follow-on activities that you think are necessary beyond the toolkit, we should uh, we could talk about those uh, offline. If you want to email me or email staff with those suggestions, that would be great. Um, my suggestion was, you know, that list of uh, of agencies that impact so many of us. I know they've been having discussions with staff. Our work has already stimulated some of those discussions. James has told me about it. We might want to formalize that next year. Uh, along with some other smaller segment of this toolkit is my thought. We'd have to sell the SACOG board on that idea, but uh, I don't think that would be too, too terribly difficult. We'll just have to have to say it depends on what their chair next year, Ricky, thinks um, with regard to <laughs> any, any important carry on activities. So with that, Chair Sander. Yes, go ahead, James. If you don't mind, you, you, you jump so efficiently right into the wrap up. And I, I just for everybody here, because I think by the time you all meet again uh, towards the end of the calendar year, uh, you know, we'll have the toolkit and these green zones will be, I think, marching through. And I'm kind of looking for Jennifer that and, and, and really percolating. But I did, especially for the non SACOG board members and for the SACOG board members, I just, I wanted to put that pin in how important these, these green zones are, the bottom up, the locally driven infill areas. And it really is about cities and counties across our entire six county region now designating these areas. And as, as Jennifer said, not just the downtowns, but the commercial corridors. So you could think of this as calling all commercial corridors. Um, and I think as we've been pretty clear about this, uh, while we think there's tremendous uh, revitalization and housing opportunities, small business opportunities, this is the chance for our cities and counties to say, yes, this is the, here's our priority corridor. These are these green zones and they will be adopted by our local jurisdictions. And we really need to be working very closely with all of you in the private sector at the state level, um, as, as Jennifer said, we've been having great conversations with folks like Regional SAN and our Regional Water Authority and some of our other partners. What can they do, SMUD even, right, to actually make those green zones, uh, reduce those barriers, uh, not cl clear off those 180 government uh, agency barriers. So I, I just can't tell you enough how excited we are. The board uh, adopted this, the great staff work that's been put into this. And now this is truly the period where we will have a, 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 a bottom-up uh, process for adopting these places and making it a priority that is then, then uniquely owned uh, by this region. So it's a great opportunity. Very good. Thank you, James. That frames it extremely well.
Any other comments before we adjourn? Mr. Chair, if I could just uh, reiterate. Yes, Thank you. Uh, Jennifer mentioned at the top of her presentation, as did Dov, that um, over the next two weeks, if any of the members board the private sector um, have additional feedback, we are um, able to incorporate that and you can connect directly with me and I will bring Jennifer and Dov along or if you want to reach out to Lynette to connect us. So we, we welcome continued feedback over the next two weeks. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Very good. Thank you all very much for your, your efforts and your diligence here. This is for the benefit of our whole region. Um, so I'm very proud of uh, the work we've done and the input we've gathered. I will see you all again uh, in November, if not before. So we're, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.